guys, I wanted to go over with you some uh, ideas that I had to help you review. Um, to, you know, I've, I've done several other videos for you all, but I wanted to go specifically into, I guess we can call them hacks. I guess that's probably the best, that's the easiest way to say it instead of, you know, pieces of advice from Mrs. Smart. Uh, but just some things that I'm, I'm beginning to see uh, that I want you focusing on as we get closer and closer to the AP exam. Uh, the first thing that I want you to do is to uh, look at page 159 of the course and exam description. And in case you don't have it in front of it, that's okay. I went ahead and I took a little screen capture of the page, uh, the section that I want you focusing on. This is a list of the task verbs that are often asked on AP human FRQs. And you can see the, their verbs. You probably have, have practiced them quite a bit over the course of the year. We've done a lot of FRQs in class, so these should be really familiar with you. Compare is a verb uh, that we off, that are, is often used, and this is when you're uh, per, trying to provide a description of two separate items or some differences. So you know, compare and contrast the or compare the and contrast the benefits of um, I don't know gentrification, something along those lines. the The biggest problem that I tend to see with compare verbs is that kids just don't finish it. Like they start it and they'll say, okay, the benefits of gentrification are, they don't talk about the negatives of gentrification. They just forget to complete that formula. I always tend to say, let's look at compare verbs, like an algebraic equation where you have to have A plus B equals C. Uh, and so that's just something to keep in mind to make sure that when you have a compare verb prompt that you're actually doing both sides of that equation. Uh, define uh, verbs. This is just simply a, a straight definition. So a vocabulary term. And I really don't think that you're going to see define this year. I really think if you have to define anything, it'll be in the describe verb because a describe verb, you have to give um, a description, right? And oftentimes when you're giving a description and talking about the characteristics of something, you have to use vocabulary and define that vocab. So I don't think define is going to be on there this year just because uh, you only have two FRQs and they're going to want you to show your knowledge as best as possible and a define verb prompt just won't do it. Explain, I you, I know you will see explain on there this year uh, and there's we're going to spend some more time on explain, but this is where you're writing and writing and writing. You're giving a lot of information. You're using the word because uh, to kind of finish out your explanation. And then of course, identify and identify once again is, is like a one sentence response. I don't know if you're going to see this this year. They may, you know, identify as an easier uh, verb uh, response. Normally this would be, you know, identify the countries or identify the region or identify the practice. And because this might be Googleable, I just don't see it being on there this year, but they, they may, they may, who knows. So uh, let's go a bit more deeper into the verb prompts, describe and explain. Uh, remember, the, the biggest issue that I always see with my students uh, is the lack of specificity. You have to be specific in your response. Too many kids want to write uh, their responses to describe and explain verb prompts in one sentence or two sentences. And you have to write. Uh, remember, college credit is writing on this. And so you need to make sure that you give as much effort as you possibly can. This is not the time to, to try and be brief here. A describe verb prompt requires details, uh, should be definitely sev several sentences long and have lots of specifics. You probably will have to put some details that require vocabulary in there. And I would want you to visualize this as if you were picking up the fo phone and talking to a grandparent about your day. You know, describe what happened today. You're not going to give it in, in one sentence. You're going to give it in several sentences or e maybe even more than that. So just kind of keep that in mind with the verb prompt described. Explain is a verb prompt that we uh, that when you're writing to an explain verb prompt, this is going to be probably your longest uh, verb prompt. And this should at least be a paragraph, maybe more than one paragraph. And you have to use the word because to keep you honest here, to keep you making sure that you're explaining because everything that happens after you write the word because that's your actual explanation. Sometimes uh, it used to be that you would see, uh, you know, an identify and explain type of uh, verb prompt. This is in the older FRQs where, you know, maybe it was like an FRQ that had an A, B, and a C. And uh, because uh, APHG, they've changed the format uh, starting this year, actually, where you're taking it out to, you know, an A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now they've broken those out. So identify is going to be its own letter and explain will be its own letter. And it's designed to actually make it easier for you to write. Uh, but I think kids can get a little intimidated by the length of these FRQs, but 
don't be intimidated. It's uh, honestly, it's designed to make it easier for you to to write uh, the FRQs. So, and also think that sometimes these explain uh, verb prompts can be like a cause and effect relationship. So I hope you can identify the model that's in front of you. Okay, no, it's not the target symbol. Looks like it. Um, and, uh, but you should I'd be very easily be able to identify this as von Thunen, right? And so I, I put this on here because I want you guys to remember the importance this year, the supreme importance this year of applying the models. Even though we don't have an apply verb prompt per se on APHD FRQs, that's what you're going to be doing because this is not stuff that's well, application of uh, models this year. It, you know, it, maybe initially it would have been, you know, define this concept or define this concept and then leading to and explain. I think they're going to jump just right into uh, application and explanation of these models. So the ones you need to be focusing on are von Thunen, which of course is from our agriculture unit. Population and migration has two of them, demographic transition model and epidemiological transition. Uh, and don't forget also about the migration transition uh, models as well. It's all in the course description. And of course, it's all in the notes from class. Uh, but these are just items I think that really did, that you need to spend a whole day just reviewing models. And um, as you review section, you know, per unit, spend some time on those models. Really, really important that you have these nailed down. Because remember, it's not going to be something along the lines of which model has a high crude birth rate and a high crude, I mean, which stage of demographic transition has a high crude birth rate and high crude death rate. And they won't do that because that's Googleable it's going to be application of these models. And so that's where you have to have a deep understanding of them. So study those models. So let's spend some time with the describe verb prompt. Uh, this is uh, an FRQ that came from the course descriptively. And I just wanted to, to point out to you, looking at this, notice how many verb prompts you have here that are higher level, right? You have describe, describe, explain, um, describe, explain, explain, explain. So these are all really higher level um, FRQ prompts. So the first one, describe the data in the table that classifies Delhi as a mega city. So I went ahead and I grabbed this as well. This is the table that they're talking about. And you can see here. So first of all, you have to know what a mega city is. So that's actually how I would approach that first. A mega city, which is a city that has more than 10 million people be seen um, in the Delhi region beginning in the year 2001, you know, prior to 2001, uh, well, at least, at, at least in 1991 with their census there, uh, they were not at that mega city level because they were below 10 million, but after 2001, and then of course in 2011, when they had the census, then you can definitely see the trend into mega city and then beyond. So, uh, and the next one says, describe a pool factor that has contributed to Delhi's total population change over time. So you can see more and more people are coming in actually at a rapid pace that are coming into Delhi. And so this is where you go back to what the concept of a pool factor is. And we know a pool factor is something that's an enticement for people to migrate. And of course, what would the enticement of people migrating to, to a big city? This is using gravity model, right? Uh, bringing people in uh, to a big city like Delhi would, of course, be jobs. I mean, nobody wants to go. This is part of the, the image here. You can see that just the tremendous pollution um, in Delhi uh, due to the population levels. No one's going to be pulled to Delhi because of the pollution. They're not like, hey, I want to live, you know, and, and clog up my, my lungs with smog. They're not thinking that. They're thinking that they want to go get a job. And of course, this is part of demographic transition. So there's a lot of information that you can get just from really the images that we see here. Let's go back down to the explain. So uh, here's an explain verb prompt. Explain the challenge to Delhi's local environmental sustainability that is shown in the photograph. So this would have come from cities and urban, uh, cities urban section where we talk about environmental sustainability. And if you're looking at, and unfortunately I didn't think to grab the entire image here, but you can see just by looking at this section, you've got a, a, a you know huge traffic jam, you have you know smog-like conditions. So uh, the challenge to local environmental sustainability would be the, the problem of uh, pollution, heavy pollution due to increased automobile usage, due to increased population. That would be a way that you can go with that. There's a lot of different ways that you can go with that. Um, another one, you know, explain a possible solution to the challenge of environmental sustainability that is shown in the photograph. So you could say something along the line. I mean, this is where you're thinking cities and urban, right? Challenges to urbanization. When we think of public transportation, when we think of, you know, people not living in suburbs that increase, you know, increases pollution levels because they have to commute. But public transportation 
uh, things like, uh, you know, rail systems, subway systems, that type of thing. Those are, are car sharing, any number of different things that would be at the top of your list to try and, and uh, write a response to this particular FRQ question. Um, when you're doing uh, an explain, remember that you're, you're having to stretch this out as much as possible well, with as many details as possible. And that term I, I keep using, which is specificity. You're using vocabulary terms here. You're defining those vocabulary terms. You really, really need to write. And especially if you see a degree prompt that says, you know, like part F here, explain the degree to which. Uh, this is where you're really, really demonstrating your knowledge um, of a particular region and, of course, of concepts, because this is asking you to combine several different things here. Economic development, so levels of economic activity, which, of course, they're going to be in secondary manufacturing, along with sustainability. So this is actually a, quite a, a doozy of, not a doozy, but a really challenging um, FRQ prompt on part F here because they're asking you to combine several different items into just part F. So just make sure that when you see explain the degree to which you're writing your heart out. Uh, to switch uh, uh, sections here, I want to make sure that you're aware of the concept of changing scales. This is all over your FRQs. I'm sorry, sorry all over the course description where they ask you to make sure that you can change scales. We talk about it at the beginning of the year, changing scale, small scale, large scale, and the differences between those. But I wanted to, to pull two maps from you. And these are maps that I pulled um, just recently over the past few days showing impact of coronavirus. Uh, this is, of course, these are early maps. And uh, one is uh, when you're looking, they're both United States maps, right? And one has uh, the states labeled with total cases, but the other one has cases by county. And so I will show this to you so you could see the difference, see the impact, because when you're looking at total cases in the United States, you can see, oh, you're like, oh my gosh, there are so many cases whenever this particular map was, was made all over the United States. But then when you look at it by county, you realize that there are huge swaths of the United States that had no declared cases at all. Changing scales changes your perception about a, a particular situation and it gives you, it can give you a bit more data or maybe it can muddy the data. This gives you more. And actually, if we were to zoom in to, let's say, one of the counties here and see a map of where the cases are in the county, that would be a completely different looking at the data. So just make sure changing scales is something that you often see on FRQs. And I just want to make sure that you're thinking about that with regards to any map that you're looking at. Uh, one more item, I love using this FRQ with my students and those of you that are my students, you know this FRQ. Uh, make sure that you know what the FRQ is asking. This particular FRQ often would get my students trapped because first of all, they're nervous. And at this point in time, I don't think that we had done the map of South Asia yet. Maybe we had, I can't remember. But oftentimes they would think that this was Africa. Okay, because they're looking at it at first glance, they're nervous, their amygdala is firing, and they're, you know, can't quite get the information. And they're like, okay, this is Madagascar, and this is Africa. And once we go over the FRQ, they're like, oh, Mrs. Smart, I'm so, I know that's not Africa. Why did I put Africa? And I service. And this is where you need to slow down and really think about what's being asked of you. Uh, so just, I wanted to just kind of throw that out there because I do tend to see this every now and again. So a, a few uh, final exam tips for you or hacks for you is uh, I have a lot of students asking me, hey, Mrs. Smart, can I have my notes on the exam? Of course, guys, of course you can have your notes on the exam. The, the APs told you that. But just to kind of think about this for a second, you have two FRQs. One is 20 minutes and one is 15 minutes. And you will not have the time to go thumbing through your notes and flipping through your notes, looking for answers to your FRQ, to the FRQ. And remember, this is going to be uh, timed and you have to make sure that you get everything done with the time that it's given. Or if you're not, if you can't, then and if you don't upload, then they're not going to score that particular section of your FRQ. Okay. So it's really important for you to, to realize that you're under a time limit and, um, you know, in prepping for this, you really need to treat this like a regular AP, making sure that you're going through practical, uh, multiple, that you practice multiple choice questions that you're, being, you know, you're studying everything that you're studying all sections of this, especially focusing on those aspects of, of relevant, like levels of economic activity and, and basic industrialization. And, you know, for cities and urban, understanding why 
country is urbanized and the, the basic process of urbanization. Um, focusing on vocabulary, really, really reviewing daily your vocab terms, reviewing your models, and also practice time typing, okay? Get in the habit of having a, a countdown clock in front of you. And uh, when I give you FRQs to practice that you are going through those uh, practice FRQs with a, you know, a countdown clock in front of you. I want you to be nervous as you're practicing because then what happens is, is if we practice strong and by the time, you know, and we practice in a legitimate testing type of environment, when you go and take your FRQ for real, it, you're going to be desensitized to that countdown clock and to typing and all those things. When College Board opens up those practice modules, please make sure that you do them. That's the very best way for you to be in an authentic testing environment. So I hope this help, helped you today to kind of view, focus in on where you need to be with regards to practicing for this particular exam. And uh, I hope you guys have a great afternoon.